Okay, welcome once again to our program. As a matter of fact, I shouldn't say once again. This is the first type of program we have of this sort. You usually see my mug on television talking to people with problems on the telephone. But we're trying to do something a little different this evening, and it will take some kind of involvement. And I don't want to, you to sit there, you know, like I said a few moments ago, like a bunch of dummies, but I want you to get involved with what I'm saying, because unless you can express yourself and let loose with what you've been thinking and feeling all along, and let me make some commentary on it, it it's, nothing's going to happen to you. You're not going to change. You sort of have a lot of feelings, a lot of motives that you have hidden and buried, secret sentiments that have never come to view. Unless you get those secret sentiments out into the open, and that's not easy in the short time we've got. But unless you bring it to the surface and use this opportunity to do so, um, you'll never change. You'll never become better. You can't ask the local bartender because all he'll do. You may, you may, ask the local bartender and and bear your innermost feelings, but all you do is get sympathy, you know, reassurance that the wrong is right, and then you're a lot worse than you ever were before. Bless you. <laughs> and uh, so this evening, I just want you to just let your hair down and see if we can't get into into you, the real you, the psychotic you, the part of you that never talks. Maybe the part that talks too much. We get a few of those too. And see if we can't shine a light on what's lurking in there and those subtle currents, the interplay of energies between human beings that no one ever talks about, but are, are terribly destructive. It's what you really don't see and what you can't prove, the innuendos, the attitudes, the, the pretended love out of hate. But you see, it's underneath there's the smoldering hate, but, but there seems to be love. And some, there's something wrong with that love, which makes you hate, which makes you feel guilty, which produces love. But there's something wrong with that love. See, so, who's got a problem with, I, I've got one card here that might start it off pretty good. Uh, should a wife carry out her wifely duties at home? Um, who's got that problem? Wifely duties and anger. Who wrote this? Did you write that? Well, could you explain to me what you, I can't, it sounds like it might be a very, very, very good question, so... Um, can you can you reach him over there? Okay, right away. Go ahead. Uh, I feel uh, that my wife is not doing her what she sh her, should, what you married her for should be doing at home. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is that we we know what we're talking about, don't we? You're yes. talking. Is it sex? No. Oh, I thought wifely duty. <laughs> Wifely duties. Okay. What uh, else? What other wifely duties you can? Uh, aren't those the most important wifely duty? I mean, she doesn't wash up. Yes. She doesn't make the beds. Uh huh. But she does all right in bed. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought you'd get to it. I mean, could you be more explicit, please? Well, uh, she is a housewife, and uh, and I really think that I shouldn't have to get, uh, really have to get, get strong in the her. morning time and have to press my own clothes and do, do all this if she's going to be at home, okay? But is, is your wife, is your wife a housewife and she doesn't go to work? Right. And she's got nothing else to do but do those things that should yes. be done by such a partner, right? And it's not being done and... Uh, but she doesn't love you. I know that, but... Is, could she be doing that out of rebellion? You know, what, what about you? What do you have to say? Why don't you do that? Oh, well, um, it, is, it, it does have to do with the hate I do have Why do you hate him? him? Why do you hate him? Because he doesn't show me the proper love that well, he no. should. What, do you know what love... He is demands, you know, rather than asking me to do whatever... Well, maybe he demands... No, to do. no, but maybe he demands from you because... See, let's, we, we've got to find out who the, the guilty one is here. Because sometimes it, 
sometimes we can't find where it begins, which begins, which comes first, the chicken or the egg. So we're going to find out whether you, you're the one that lays the egg or whether he's the one that lays the egg, right? <laughs> See? <laughs> or who's got the egg all over his face? <laughs> one of the two. But maybe it has something to do with you being typical female and wanting to be the ruler of the roost and wanting to be served and worshipped and loved and it's almost like an auto mechanic. Have you ever been to an auto mechanic and you pay him money? And if he has an ego problem, he doesn't do his job properly. Mm -hmm. He doesn't fix your car, but he goes through the motions like kings, like a king on a stage. He goes through the motions and collects his tribute at the end of the day, but he doesn't fix your car. He pretends like he does it, but he will not serve anyone because he is the king. Why should he serve? He only goes through the motion of serving and then he collects his money. And then when you complain about it, it makes you feel like there's something wrong with you. And pretty soon you walk away and you get mad and, and you, you, you may go back three or four times, but you, you don't get your car fixed. Then you go to another place and it's the same thing. Now, women tend to be the same way. Um, once you want to be served. And maybe, maybe, maybe that's your problem. You need a correction. And, and that's what... That's what love is all about. Perhaps he doesn't correct you properly. Perhaps you are so stubborn that you force him to be stronger than he needs to be. And that's the same with your children. If you do, if you, if you, um, if you support your children, for example, if you say, Daddy won't know that you can have this candy, you can have ice cream, don't tell your daddy about that. If you're supportive to your child or go against the orders of your husband, when he comes home at night, and he sees that the kid is still hasn't done what the child is supposed to have done mm -hmm. because you have secretly conspired to make the child rebellious. Then the child, then the husband, is has to be stronger with the child than he would normally have to be. And it brings out the violence in a man. So could it be that your stubbornness, instead of taking the correction, instead of him saying to you, now look, that's not right, you know, I work hard, I come home, um, don't you think it's right that you should at least make the beds and make me a nice dinner? And why should he have to tell you that? Shouldn't it be a natural knowledge on your part if you love your husband? Yes, that's you, true. You agree? I, it should, yes, I do agree. So it should be something does, that I should do automatically. Then why don't you do it? Well, um, You're rebelling though, aren't you? Yes. Mm -hmm. well, see, in other words, the more he tells you to do it, the more you rebel against it. Mm -hmm. And the more you don't do it. And then when I do, although it should be done regardless, you know, since that is my duty of yes. being a housewife, then, but then he doesn't appreciate it. I mean... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Just, you still got to do it mm -hmm. whether he appreciates it. His appreciation is not your problem. Not, mm -hmm. It shouldn't be your problem. It should be his problem. You should do, you, you, you're not doing it for appreciation, are you? Well, I should be. Yeah. No, no, you shouldn't be doing it. You should do it. Um, it should, be done. should, um, should people, should the work, should you appreciate your worker? I mean, you give him money every day. That's what he works for. That's true. Not necessarily, but. Um, he brings, he brings money home every day. He's there for you. Isn't that enough for you? Well, actually, um, no, that's not so either. What do you want? What do you want from him? You want appreciation? The right, the right type of love. What is that? Correction. He, but, but, but when, you give, he, when he, he corrects you, mm -hmm. when he corrects you and says, look, you, you should make the dinner mm -hmm. and you should, you should keep the kids but nicely dressed and iron the clothes, you rebel against it. Yeah, because he's mean. Well, what about your love? What about if you just, never mind if he was mean, maybe instead of rebelling against his meanness and doing just the opposite and making him meaner, and using his meanness to rebel to, as an excuse not to do it. Don't you see there's no end to this? The more you do the opposite of what you're supposed to do, the meaner he gets. The meaner he gets, the more you get upset. The more you get upset, the more, the less, the more you rebel. Yeah, the more you rebel, the more you don't do it. The more you don't do it, the meaner he gets. There's no ending to the meaning. That's true. Could it be the could it be a validation really for the for the fact that you never wanted to do it in the first place? <laughs> Sometimes I really don't. I mean what is your motive in this? What is your what is your motive? Um if your child is mean, mm -hmm. do you don't feed him? Of 
course, I do. Oh. Mm -hmm. Doesn't doesn't God make the rain shine upon the just and the unjust? Yeah. Why should you withhold your wifely duty mm -hmm. from your husband because he's mean? No, you can't have dinner because you're mean. No, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna iron the clothes because you're mean. And no, I'm not gonna give you anything to eat because you're mean. Those are not the things you withhold That's when he's true. mean. That is true. Because then he's gonna say, Well, if you're not gonna serve my dinner, I won't bring home the money. Which sometimes will. There you go. There it goes. And then he so if you're not gonna if you're if you're gonna be mean like that, I'll go find some other woman. And then you brought it upon yourself. Now, which one of you is going to be smart? <clears throat> which one of you is going to be smart first? I mean, one of you has to be smart first. Well, I have already gone that far. You have? Quite a few times. What do you uh, mean, gone that far? I mean, gone out with another woman? Yes. It happens. See? It's but only because you have one quality that you've got to give up that stimulates this vicious cycle between you. You both have the same quality. You know what that quality is? Resentment. If he is not right, and he does, he's mean, and he is thoughtless, the reason meanness or thoughtlessness or cruelty is the reason for love. Why don't you be a mature woman and instead of looking for love, give it yourself. Instead of looking for love from him, mm -hmm. give love. Return good for evil. Mm -hmm. um, Could you do that? Sure, I can. But do not that. if you resent him. You do resent him, don't you? Yes, I do. And then you can't return good for evil. Because, um, like, I listen to your the program regularly, you know, yeah. daily, and um, it seems that when I do um, become better in 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 different areas. It seems that he becomes worse. I mean, he takes advantage. You know, it's like. Oh, oh no! But you, you know what you're saying. Him. You know, so you know what I hear you worse. saying. I, I hear. I know what you're saying. I'm. I'll try being nice to him and see what happens, and see if he changes. Mm -hmm. But but after a few days or a few weeks of being nice and he doesn't change, then you go back going back to your old mean self. That's not love. Is it love? No, it isn't. Why should you let whatever he is affect whatever love should be forthcoming from you? He, okay. it, it's manipulation. What you're doing with that kind of love, mm -hmm. it's manipulating him into being good. And he senses it. He senses you playing a game with him. Because I know when you have that kind of love, it is very obvious that you're going out of your way to impress him, to show him that, that no matter how bad he is, you're going to be good. Mm -hmm. And you're going to try to make him ashamed of himself so he will be good. But isn't that more than what he does? If he doesn't, I mean, if I was to see him, you know, try to become better, I'm not going to make it worse and become more of, you know, a more difficult. But you're missing a point. But he never. You see, the word is he never. Mm -hmm. you, you, how old are you? 23. 23. He never. How long have you been married? Two well, years? About four. About four. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, four years. I mean, he never is a long time, yeah, isn't it? As long as we've been. Yeah, I know, but you, but you never, you never loved him. You've never overcome his. Look, what is the purpose of marriage? The purpose of marriage is to overcome your weaknesses. True. See, isn't that right? Yes. Is to overcome selfishness. If you weren't married, you wouldn't have a reason to be unselfish. You see? So, he's got faults. You know, I mean, if he was perfect, he wouldn't have married you. Because he'd been walking on water. <laughs> and old Chase, see, he never got married. He'd already gone part. See, when you finally have worked out your problems between you and learned to love one another, then maybe you will be in a state beyond marriage. See? And, uh, but meanwhile, the marriage is where you learn to learn to love each other. You never fell in love, you fell in heat. Yes. See? <laughs> yes, both of you, you. You're both in heat, you weren't in love. And you have to grow out of that understanding. You're both servicing each other's selfishness when you got married. Do, do you feel that it's the right thing that, um, well, I am getting my business established, that I am at home, 
do you think that my role as a mother is to be home with my child because absolutely he feels that, what that do you, I need to work. Oh, he's wrong. Because. Now I want to give it to you. Okay, well uh, now you're going to get it. Uh, that's right there. <laughs> As anybody wants to join in with this, you can because is anybody identified with anything here? You could just let me know if you got feel like an urge. Put your hand up and reveal yourself. <laughs> okay. Go, you know, now what? Don't you see what a natural role of a woman is? Is to be a mother and a wife. To hell with women's lib, right? Mm -hmm. To hell with them. That's where they're going anyway and leaving the rest of the country there if we're not careful. Now, that's why a woman, that's what marriage is all about, is that a woman needs to find a man that's responsible and loyal and dependable and worthy. Exactly. See? Exactly. And when the man, when she finds that, she, then she feels that she can have a child because, the, you know, you can't bring up a, a child without a husband, mm -hmm. without a source of income, without protection for the vile environment, mm -hmm. the crazy world out there, chicken hawks and all the rest of them. So, but you, but you want to be, want to stay home, don't you? Of course I do. Of course I. It's I, natural, I would isn't it? To be, you know. So what you pushing? What you pushing her to work for? Can be, and he is it. Uh, let me ask you this: um, um, Is he? Is his responsibility as a husband? Isn't it supposed to be like we're supposed to be like good best friends? I mean, you know, like friends. Yeah, what right? does that mean? What, well, what do friends do? Well, the type of friend I'm, I'm speaking. You know, we're supposed to communicate with one another. What He's you, supposed to support me in my business, right? Wait a minute. Are you, are you a helpmate or a playmate? Is he married to you? Are you? Is he married to you, or are you married to him? It's a he's, very important. He's, he, he's married. I'm married to him. Okay, but you're not. You, yeah, that, he's I'm not married, married to you. You're married to him. I'm married to him. You got to get this in the right order. Mm -hmm. In other words, he's the man. Mm -hmm. And you're the woman. All the women with livers will be picketing outside the station tonight. But um, he's the man, mm -hmm. and you're the woman. Mm -hmm. You see something good in him. You're hitching your wagon to his star. You're going to help him to accomplish whatever good there is in his life. You're, you're attached to your Your goodness is loyal to his goodness. Mm -hmm. So what's so difficult about that? He's the man that works, and you're the woman that... Re stands behind him in that work mm -hmm. and reassures him and supports him in his work. But he's the one that's supposed to work and you've work. got your work to look after the children. Right. And if you don't have any children, that's a different story. Mm -hmm. And then you can be a partner in his business and when he gets older, when the children are older, then you can, and they leave the home. It's a different story, but you've got your love for your children must be greater than the love for your husband. Idiot. You must not love your husband more than your children. Mm -hmm. There's something wrong with that. I agree. You understand that? Mm -hmm. Nobody else is joining in yet. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the real reason why... We haven't got to anybody else yet. I think I've got to everybody, but no one's saying anything. Uh, mm -hmm. The real reason why I want her to go to work is because she is not doing what she should be doing at home. Just well, no, that's not just that's very poor logic. You know, you see, okay, so you won't make my bed and you won't feed my kids right and you won't iron my clothes, so out into the cold world you go and work. You might so, but that's you putting pressure on unnatural pressure. We got another question over there. Just you see the point, ladies and gentlemen, what we're trying to do. Um, this this concept is leading somewhere, and it, you may have some objection to this. And I'd much I'd love to talk to you about your objection to it because there must be some kind of feisty little objection that I can overcome. Yes. Now, go ahead. Yes, I'm a mother of three children, and I also work. And lately, I've been wondering: is is my role? Should I quit my job, or should I go to work? Should I stay home because I'm a working mother? I'm a working. Well, mother, you have no choice. Wife. I, you have no choice, do you? Well, I, I guess I do. I can I either mean, work. You work or are you married to a husband? Oh, you have a husband. Right. Yeah. Well, what, what, what do you think? Well, I've, I've been forced to work, but right now, in my situation, I sell cars, and it's been pretty tough. And uh, it, the in, extra income helps. And I'm just looking for a time when, when it's possible that she can, you know, when I start getting myself better off as far as working and maybe. How old are the children? Uh, my son's 11, my daughter's 10, and then uh, she has another uh, son from another guy that's... An older, uh, an older? 
Yeah. No. Uh, no, no, he's, he's uh, six. Six, yeah. I mean younger, excuse me. Yeah, yeah. And um, it's just it's just a situation. I don't I want her to stay home with the kids right now. <clears throat> but it's just a situation of a matter of income. Well, how long has it been going like this? Well, we were divorced for about five or six years. And I we're see. trying to get back together. Yeah. And so as we're trying to get back together and, and get our lives straightened out, um, she had already had the job and I was working. So we're just trying to uh, get our act together. Um, well, I, I, I listen, if the wolf was at the door, children understand that. Children understand that when a mother has to go out and the father's dead, there's a magical understanding that children have automatically. Don't sell them short. They're very intelligent. They're very perceptive. And as they see the mother having to go out in a blizzard every day to bring food home and because his father died, he's not going to hate his mother for that. But he is going to hate his mother because they're too ambitious swine and they want the best of everything. And, they, and, and they've, they, all they're going to work for is not for the kids, but to satisfy, their, gratify their own selfishness. The kids know the difference, you see. And they leave them with a babysitter. And the babysitter brings them up. And the babysitter then abuses them. Well, uh, I mean, did you, you got children. Did you get married to have a babysitter to bring up your children? Is that what you want so that they recognize the babysitter as mama? No. Do you really think the babysitter has enough brains or, or the preschool, wherever you leave them? You think those people have the qualifications to bring up your kid? No. That's, no, you don't. That's what, what I'm saying. I think... I, my place should be with raising my kids. and You know it, don't you? And you yeah. In your soul. And it's really hurting them. It's hurting all of us. It is think. hurting them. There's no question. This is the breakup of the American family because, well, you know, I, I can go into the taxes which have forced you know, men and women, both men and women out and the, leaving the chicken hawks to, to raid the, the nest and kill the children and destroy the children. And the kids don't have a mother and father to guide them. Two ambitious swine out there you know, working as hard as they can, hating the government, giving... It takes two now to... It often takes two to make a halfway decent living uh, because the government takes so much. And there's all kinds of hostilities and resentments because, uh, because we no longer pay for our own sins. The people, the sinners of the world, don't pay for their own sins. The taxpayers do for AIDS and welfare. So we're paying for their education. Someone somewhere in some dark part of the city is uh, some woman who doesn't know who the, their fa the father is of the, her 12 children. They get, they, they, she's getting money and welfare and a nice place to live and you're slaving your butt off. And you can't even get enough. For, and, your kid, and your kids don't have a father either. So we've got something wrong with the society we're living in. But I'm suggesting the greatest gift that you can give to your children, the very greatest, the most beautiful thing you can do, is to give them a mother and a father, a father that goes to work, a, a mother that loves her husband and makes the best of what she's got and sews and buys from thrift stores. See, you're going to have a much happier home and you drive in, a, in 1954 DeSoto. You're much better off. I tell you, you are much better off. You'll be a happier home and get out of a big city and get away from the scumbags that, that live around you, that corrupt your children. But have a mother at home, one that loves her husband. Because you see, the family has, the family has a very beautiful order. Um, if, if, if a man is respectable, if there is a good spirit of loyalty and love, if a man loves what's right more than he loves his wife, you have to love what, gentlemen, you have to love what's right more than your wife, because that is pure goodness. If you love your wife more than what's right, you're only loving your wife because you're not right and you feel good because she worships you. And you worship her and you're really emotionally involved in a big trouble. You're in a big pile of shaving cream, right? <laughs> but if a, woman, if a man loves what's right and a woman sees that love, that love of right in him, that strength, that resoluteness, that fidelity, right, in him, she corresponds with that. She supports that. She loves that. She respects it. She's conjoined with it. Then that love of her husband's light is her light also. And the children see that as a military chain of command. It's, there's a military chain of command. And you'll see that your whole household will be in order. All right? 
Now we've got another caller, I mean, caller, I'm getting, I'm getting a bit dingy here. You know, my radio programs and... Okay, but how, how long do you wait for it to work? I mean, you know, Forever. so... Forever. Well, okay, so you wait and what I'm saying it, is... So let me put it this way, it <laughs> okay. does work. Yes, I know. You see, it's only the worker that isn't workable. Yeah, I don't have, you know any, I mean? yeah, I don't have any doubt about that. See, I'm just if saying... It's, if it's in you, if yeah. it's in you, if you've really got the quality, you, you've got the... You've got the um, the staying power. Right. It's the staying power that women test. Mm -hmm. Sure. And I don't have any doubt about that. I'm, I, I, what I'm saying is that if it seems like it's taking three years with cr crawlingly little results, you know, does that mean that I'm, hey, I'm crawling in the wrong direction? Hold or? It. it could mean that you're crawling in the wrong direction. That's what it I'm could asking. be you're, some, you're following Roy's master's directions. What does page three say? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> no, remember, I'm, I'm a married man. I'm 59 years old. I've got a 33-year-old son and grandchildren, and I've got a wife as a pill. So, I mean, she knows it, and but she loves me. I stand with her. I never look at other women. I look, but I don't look. <laughs> you know, I don't give that kind of look. It isn't in me that. But what, see, what if certain no, things seem to get worse? No, no. See. My woman, my wife, good, the good Lord gave me my wife as a stubborn as she can come. Mm -hmm. Okay? But there's a reason. I only became a better person. So, so what if she never makes it? So what, what if she s excuses herself all the way to the grave? Mm -hmm. And the very last minute she says, Roy, you were right. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, it's almost like Jesus dying on the cross. One man said, one of the, one of the criminals said, hey, look at you, you know, you're supposed to be the son of God. Why don't you take us, take your, us on the cross and, and take yourself off? And the other guy says, stop mocking him. We deserve what we've got. See what I mean? I mean, you, you don't know. If you had a wife from the very beginning who loved you and obeyed you and worshipped you, you'd be a dead man. <laughs> what you need is a wife that gives you a hard time. I'm sorry, that's all the time we've got right now. Why don't you join us tomorrow night for part two of this husband-wife relationships. Join us. See you tomorrow night. The very best woman for every man is a woman who gives a man a hard time. And okay. makes him reach into himself. But how do you make the, the strength the, to love her? How do you make her? the household work? How do you? It you know, will work. Bring your children home from the therapist. You know, I mean, that's right. <laughs> you have to find light. You must have and come out of the darkness. You have to stop being a woman-centered man. You have to stop conniving and trying to make something work. You just have to be, so that everything is the extension of you. Do you know? I'll tell you a little secret. Now, this sounds very egotistical, and from my first show here. Uh, people are going to misunderstand me. But my wife can't be bad, even if she tries, because a woman reflects a man, or, or a man reflects the woman, and mostly the man does reflect the woman, and that's the, ma that's the woman's frustration, isn't it, ladies? As a matter of fact, a woman reflects a man's meanness, his weakness, his cowardliness, his inability to save her from herself. He isn't strong enough in the light. See what I'm saying? He's too dependent on her favors. So what favors. you're saying is, is it, it takes as long as it takes for it to work inside me It first. takes as long as it takes without using your will, mm -hmm. without using your force, but having a quiet strength like Gary Cooper. But, you know, maybe he was too quiet. But the point is, it's like a quiet strength that never is ruffled, that's never disturbed, that's never frustrated because it didn't work this week or next week or, next week or the week after. Remember, 34 years I've been waiting. <laughs> and uh, I remember, uh, there's, there's, you know, I remember what Socrates once said about that, since we have to have a little anecdote here. He says it's, uh, it's good for men to marry, and uh, if he gets a good wife, that's good for society, and he gets a bad one, he becomes a philosopher. So I could end up a philosopher, but that's good for society too. But I'm saying is that the chances are 99% that the woman, after keep trying you, and trying you, and trying you, and trying you, and never end, she's looking for something in you, in you that she, she can't hate. A woman is looking for a man that she can't hate. And that 
when it, but you'll have to try it and try it. A woman doesn't, doesn't forgive easily. You, you, you cross a woman one time and she'll hate you for the rest of your life. And she'll put that hate, she'll hate all men. She started with her father and you represent her father. She picked you unconsciously because you, you, you fall naturally into that category and give her a reason to go on hating and hating so that, because she doesn't know how to stop hating. Because hating wrong to her is her way of life. It's the way she feels right and secure. See, so you're going to have to find some, you're going to have to find some strength inside yourself to deal with the woman's madness because most women are crazy. <laughs> and most men are weak. You see, and, and you're going to have to find, and the reason why women are crazy is because weak men bring out the frustration, the craziness in that woman. So, so naturally, she, she, her craziness, her craziness is what you, you know you're, you're dealing with. You had it in your mother, and you're attracted to it in your wife. We won't go into all the reasons. We haven't got time this evening, because you've heard me talk about it on my radio show. Every man is attracted to the woman that's just like a mother, and every woman is attracted to the man that's like a father. And they hate each other's guts, but they look like they like each other. <laughs> because they're both addicted to hate. See? So, you're just going to have to be the kind of man that when a woman comes against you in her unreasonable ways and trying to aggravate you or even seduce you by pretending she loves you because she, she wants to weaken you so that she can have this wimp she can enjoy hating. Most women, when they love, they don't love because they love. They're testing you for your strength. They're seducing you to get a fur coat. See? They're, they're, they're making up for their guilt, or, and they're weakening you to, make, to, to become a hate object. They want to make you fall. They'll, they use sex or they use tease. They, they're mean with to you one minute and nice to you the next, and both of them are designed to weaken you so they can get a, their hate fix. No. When you're looking at all this unreasonable behavior and you feel yourself reacting to it, you are the extension of that woman. You're the extension of her private hell. But if you are like a rock and everything comes against you and you don't resent her and you don't respond to her and you don't, you don't, um, you don't respond to the challenge with her anger, with more anger, her craziness with more craziness. Remember, you're the, being the extension of what's in her. But if, you're, if you hold fur fast, she will see that you're an extension of something greater than both of you. And only then can you save her from herself? Only when she's fully tested it and she's satisfied that it's there will she melt into that and you'll live happily ever after. Young, yes, yes. Well, what if it's the other way around? And I'm not saying I, don't, I'm, I have problems, or lots of them, but my husband is a pill. And uh, is it possible? It's very, very possible that a woman is more wise than the man sometimes. And he's also very stubborn and it's very hard to get him to even consider that what so I what is the situation that um, that you are that you're thinking about when you're saying that well we have a lot of problems he drinks a lot he but you, you tell work. me you have a lot of problems but you're not saying what those problems are um, see you seem see. emotional to me I'm very emotional I am I am an emotional person. Meaning, I, what does that mean? Well, we fight a lot. We have a two-year-old daughter, and we fight and, a lot. And, and what good is that fighting? It's awful. It's and what are you? Good. What are you trying to accomplish? What are you? What are you trying to will your husband to do when you're, <laughs> when you're fighting? After when you fight, you're trying to win a point, aren't you? Well, I want him to be what right. Okay, now do you think because you, I need correction. But do you think that you can force him to be right? I know I can't force him. Then why are you forcing him? Because I don't, I can't control. In other words, are you saying that the only way you can be right if he's right? Therefore, you're threatened if he's not right. Do you no. know children are that way with their parents? They they resent their parents because they're not right, because they feel that the, the unrightness of the parent is a threat to the child's innocence, because the parents have to be right, a good shining star, you know, a good influence, moral influence. When a parent Child, child comes home and sees their mother going out with other men or something like that. You can't believe the shock in, in their system when they see the immorality of their parents. 
because they want and they hate their parents for not being right. But that's how they become wrong. If they would have forgiven their parents, they, you know, how does a child know what, what forgiveness is? But if they could forgive their parents for being wrong, they wouldn't have lost their innocence. So if you could forgive your husband, see, that's it. You are caught up in an intrigue. The more wrong he is, the more you resent him. I do. The more resent him, the more res- you resent him, the more guilty you feel as a but person. The only way I know to, to counteract that is by meditating. Yeah, but, what meditate. it, but you meditate for what reason? To become right. S- mainly, yeah, to become right. Yeah, but you don't need your husband. Right. Listen, it would be nice if it would be your husband that would be your teacher. Yes, it would. Okay, but it's Roy Masters that's your teacher now. It, it would be nice in the days when Christ walked the earth. Yeah, but you don't live in my hus- house with my daughter and me. Pardon? You don't live in my house with my daughter and me. I don't have to. I live in my house. You don't live in my house with my I sons know, and my I wife. I but you're not there to correct me all the time. And, I, and so how does that help No, me? no, you don't need a man to correct you in your house. I'm the man. I could be that man, just like Christ, when he was there at the time, acted as the father for all women and also the father that they never had for all men. That's all you need is a man because otherwise you look... Isn't it true that women look at men... And they know that men, all men are alike. That's what they say. Yeah, all men are alike. They're all after the same thing. They're all selfish and rotten. and They don't know what love is. They just want you for your body. They want me for my bod. Right? And they all have the same attitude. That what's, well, that's what stirs the contempt that women have. Women enjoy that contempt. Men look at, you see a pretty girl walk by and the men go, <whistles> you know, that sort of thing. And the men, the women kind of, but they, deep down inside they like it and hate it. They get some sort of hateful stimulation out of that, a, a, an evolution of pride and contempt. But all it takes is for one man like myself. Now, I'm not saying I'm perfect like Christ is. Do you see where I'm coming from? Do you see that I, that I don't look at you like other men look at you? And don't you see I'm giving you the same... I'm, I'm like the father you never had. I never did have a father. I know, but no, no one's ever had a father. What are you I talking guess, about? I guess that's true. I mean, is there anybody here who had a father? Hands up. Anybody who had a real father here? I want to see a hand, show of hands. Well, what are you doing here then? I had, a, I had a good father too. I mean, I didn't have a bad father. I know that he was very dutiful. And he would work hard. He died when he was 42 years old. And I know my mother nagged him to death. I mean, I figured it out already. You know, he used to smoke a lot, but I never, I, he never hurt me. He was never mean to me. I don't remember much about him. He always worked hard. There's not much memory. He never left much of an impression. And when he died, I, you know, I never stopped crying. Because there's something in a child that needs something from a father. When my, listen, I must tell you this, talking personally, and I know that it's the same with all of you here. When my mother died, I, I, I had to pretend to cry. Now, I didn't hate my mother. But a mother's, the loss of a mother is not near the loss of a father. See, because you already had from your mother what could be had from a mother. But when you were five years old, you had it all. See, but what comes from a father is the most important of all. It's not only the children that need that from their father, but it's the woman, the little child in the woman that needs it from, their, from the, her husband, who, her husband, father-like husband. There's got to be a a sort of father quality in every husband. Every woman is looking for that. And it's missing in the woman. That's what corrects the little girl in the woman, you see. That's what love is, to correct the little girl, to turn the female into a woman. But what they do is they turn the woman into a female. Their animal needs servicing. And they both go backwards. You see what I'm saying, the point that I'm making? So there's something about a father. Now remember, my father was a good father too. He was as good as they come, but there was something missing. He missed. He didn't have it himself. He wouldn't have died. He wouldn't have died. He smoked himself to death, or he had a heart attack. Whatever it is, something was missing, and I needed that. And I can remember crying at his grave. Why am I crying? I don't even know the man. But but there's something I needed to know from a father, and you can know it from me. And that's why you're here. Your father was good, but not good enough. He died of cancer, and uh, my mother's pretty manipulating. She, but I don't. Uh, 
you know, through meditation, I've learned to become objective to it and yes. I don't resent her for it. And she sees that, you know, but she, that makes her try harder to, uh, and then I just let it, I just, she can get red, white, and blue in the face for all I care and get mad because. Well, you I'm, know what I'm saying about the father, though? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't interrupt your line of thought. Right. right. There's something about a father that, coming back to you again, what's your first name? Ken? Candy. Candy, okay. How sweet it is. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, there's something missing that you need from your husband, see, that you never had in your father. Right. And if you keep, then you hated your father because it was missing, didn't you? Well, he you, died, and that's why, I, that's always why I didn't think I had a father. But how old was he when he died? Nine. But you, didn't you resent your father? Oh, very much. See, that's the point. Why did you resent your father? Um, because he said something bad about me one time that I heard. Is that, you mean that one time? <laughs> Maybe it was twice. And, and that's that all, I only heard, and those are the only I know, I but ev for, for that rest of your life, you hated him only for that? I'm sure there was more I haven't. And I know, but you had lots of resentment towards him. I guess I do. See, remember I said a few moments ago, you know, you only have to cross a woman once. <laughs> She'll hate you for the rest of your life. <laughs> 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 Twice. Well, you, it was just once. See, now what it is, you've transferred this hate towards your husband. Yeah. You haven't you? Well, yes, but... And as long yeah. as you hate him, you know what's going to happen? It's going to reinforce your childlike behavior. Yes, And I it's going to turn him into a man just like your father. And then you're going to be just like your mother and father were when you were a child. You're going to become like your mother. He's going to become like your father. Because there's exactly what how they how they squabbled and fighted and for the same reasons exactly. Yeah. I, I, I think I know that. I'm just so impatient about the change, though. You have no faith. I have no faith. You know, but you know why you have pay impatience? Because resentment. What, do, what is resentment? Could you tell me? It's hate, isn't it? Yeah, it's impatience. Is it's, it impatience? Yeah, impatience. And impatience has no faith. So can you see that if you got rid of impatience or if you stop resenting it, can you see what will happen if you have enough wisdom, enlightenment, to see or perceive that there's a little seed here called resentment, out of which ground the, ab aberrant, be the aberrant behavior of a little child sprang, the you that you are now. And, that, and, and to this very day, you've carried over the same beha behavior because the only way you've ever known how to live, the only way you've known how to exist, is through having something to hate. See, because you, that's, what, that's what gave you. When you were a child, you were innocent. But your father's, the lack in your father, tempted you to hate him. In Adam and Eve, that's, in Adam and Eve, Adam's lack, Adam's failure to correct, to love Eve, must have caused her to hate. What does a woman feel when, she, when her husband fails her? It's resentment and contempt. Okay. So, men fall, in, men fall in love. Why do they fall in love? It's because they use the body of the woman to stroke his ego, to maintain his pridefulness. That's the root of all suffering in mankind. And they continue to pull, upon, pull on the woman, pull on the woman to sustain the fallen, errant nature, which is called pridefulness, which is a separation from God to be one's own God. Now, but so therefore, man's downfall came through the use of woman to support his pride. That use is failure, falling. So when men fall in love, women fall in hate. So when you look at you, so you remember your father only hatefully because he failed you. I don't remember only hatefully though, but I think I, I, I think I have resentment for him, but I don't remember that's him only it. hatefully. That's it, that's it, that's it, that's a resentment. See, you don't, people say, I don't hate anybody. Well, People don't know what the word hate means. They have some very bizarre um, <laughs> thoughts. They, you know, they see hate someone cutting, up, disemboweling somebody and, and overkilling them and stabbing them. To, that's not hate. You never see hate until it's too late. It's made up of moments badly met. When you could love, when you can forgive, you resent. When you could be patient, you become impatient. It's all the opposite. 
Now you look at, and it all begins with imp, impatience or resentment is the, is the, I'm trying to say a lot in a short time. Resentment is the key to your downfall. Men fall in love and women resent that. And that swells up inside you as a, as a negative person. See, a negative person that's born out of that and needs more of that because you don't know how to be a positive person. You only know how to be a judge and jury, maybe an executioner. There's and something that's born the out of that. do I have the power to not resent though? Pardon? Do I have the power to, to just stop resenting? No, you don't. You have the power to realize that it's wrong. Yes, and if you don't realize that it's wrong, oh, you I cannot know change. it's wrong. I do realize. Are you it's sure wrong. you're realizing? Is that the root of the problem? Now, what happens when you resent your husband? What are the feelings that come after that? Hate, anger, anger, very, very. Angry. And then, Both when the anger us. dies down, what happens? What's the feelings after that? Let's see. Then you start to love him. Yeah. And you, so you first you fight, and then you make up. Mm-hmm. See. And then I feel guilty for how I acted. Yeah, well, that's, that's right. And then you make you, and then you start to stroke his ego. You start to give. You try to make him happy. Well, I try not to stroke his ego. I try but not. But you to don't do realize that. that you are, because when you, because the kind of love that comes that follows this resentment. So here you're you're resenting your husband. Now you feel guilty, and out of the pit of that guilt, right, right, right. instead of saying to yourself, "Hey, that's wrong for resenting him. I shouldn't have done that," and feeling a little ashamed, he's wrong. But the way you reacted to it was That's also wrong. wrong. See, he got his fix, and you got his fix from from him. Don't you see? By hating him. Right. So, so you got worse, and when you get worse, you feel guilty. Now, it's typical of a woman that after she feels guilty, that something comes out of that pit of that guilt. See, she starts to make up from that guilt and starts to love him. But it isn't a true love she loves him with. She loves out of her hate, and this love ruins him. When you're loving him, you're ruining him. And when he comes down to accept this love, which comes out of your hell, the hell of your hate, mm -hmm. see? Because you're only... See, you're not sorry that you hate him. Unconsciously, you're setting him up to fall again because you're offering him this kind of love, seductive love. You think it's love, and you think you're making up, but you're not. But out of, this, out of the hell of this love comes the kind of love trips him and he falls. He comes down to accept that love and he's weaker and he's more irresponsible. He's less of the person after. Uh, haven't you noticed after you've loved him that way and had the sex that he's, not, he's worse afterwards? Yeah. Now you hate him again. And it starts all over again. You have love-hate. The love that isn't love because it comes out of hate. Mm -hmm. It's the hate that comes out of hell. It's the love that comes out of hell's hate. And if you could stop hating him, Maybe, just maybe, if you could see, see clearly to forgive him because he's locked into a habit pattern to you even as you are to him and somebody has to see it first. Somebody has to forbear to hate. Someone has to forgive. Someone's got to be patient. Could it not be you first? Yes, it could. And could you not practice that forbearance and patience endlessly? Because if it doesn't save him, it will save you. That's right. See? Yes, we have a young lady over here. Just following your line of thought, so if myself, I practice patience, that is an act of love? I mean, I, the love, hate, love, hate, my mind is going boing, you know. I'm trying to, to get a, a fix on what you're saying. You, ha you have to get out of the love, hate thing. For instance, um, you can see that hate produces a kind of love, doesn't it? Yeah, I can see that. It produces a, a kind of it, it produces a kind of seductive love in you that Never men fall of it, for. But I can, yeah, I you can, can, can you track that. with it? Yeah. So, so my question is with patience. Patience is the is patience is is a new kind of love because I when see. see because what you're doing is when you when you see something that's ill or evil, or wrong, or unjust, when you see that, we're all looking for things because we're hate-centered, death-centered. We, we need a fix of hate. We all do. We need to get upset to do our work. And sometimes, you know, we hear the expression, you know, when you're angry, you look beautiful. Because mm -hmm. men like to make women angry. 
because then they're good for a little loving afterwards. You see what I mean? <laughs> Men are purposely irresponsible because that makes women mad and then they feel, then up comes that seductive love again and they indulge. And down they go, right? They fall again and again and the women hate that. They're in a trap. You're both in a, in a trap. So what you have, I'm not saying you can't have sex. I'm saying in order to have the perfect order between man and woman, you cannot be romantic. Oh. <laughs> In other words, you can't be, you, you, you can't fantasize and be caught up in a, in a weak man because the character or the nature that a woman carries into her from her home life with her father, the failing father, the bitchy mother, the whole ball of wax, right? The failing, the, the genes of original sin, if you like, that a woman carries into marriage is to feel sorry for a weak man, uh, to, to yeah. support the wrong in him, and to bring the wrong out, and then become contemptuous of it, which fixes, again, fixes her need to hate. She's born out of hate. See? <laughs> I'm beginning to. That's... And men are born out of seduction. See, and of course they all also hate women when they find that women are controlling them. They also have hate, but then hate only makes them sexual also. It, it awakens sexual desires and it pulls them away from a state of grace so that they become more animalistic, sensual. They're fixated to the woman's love more as an answer to the emptiness of their being. See? You keep fixing each other. So you have to, what you have to learn to do is, is, to, is, is to give up resenting your husband. And, and you, are you married, by the way? Yes, to him. You are married. Are you married to, to you? Yeah, okay. we're together. <laughs> okay. It's to, it, it's to give up. I'm, I'm, see, I know he's weak. <laughs> I can take one look at him. See, if I was a mugger, I'd go for him down the street. <laughs> uh, but he's not as weak as he used to be. He's Mr. Nice Guy, see? Yeah. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde sort of thing, but Mr. Guy, Nice Guy on the surface. And you thought that when you married him, I'm sure you thought he was a nice guy. I hated him when I married him. Well, you, that's, the, that's the irony of go it. Go on, then tell me. Yeah, no, I didn't want to get married when I got married. Well, why did you marry him? It's a good question. <laughs> I'm glad I did, but at the time. Why did you hate him, and why would you marry him? Yeah. Why? Were you caught up in that? Vicious cycle? Yes. Do you know, you know, there's a book written by a young man, and I'm glad I threw it away because I, I probably mentioned the name and all the women would run for it to get lessons on it. <laughs> all the men would. But in this book, it teaches everybody how to be successful with women. And what you have to do is be a rogue, mm. you know, to upset women and to intimidate them and reject them. Mm. And this irritates women and upsets them. And women, of course, they love to be upset. And they love to have a man to hate. And the, the hate awakens the guilt. That strange form of love, that sort of feeling sorry for the man that she hates and having sympathy for it. And maybe that's what happened with you. Did you intimidate him? Did you intimidate him? No, or? no, I was just, I was just, just the wimp on, on the outside that her father was on the inside. And, and she I, hated him? Yeah. Well, that's right. So, so naturally, you're, it's, I told you, women are attracted to the men they hate. See, he's, yeah. the, he's the wimp, like, like your father, and you hated your father, and you couldn't understand, but you hated it, but you were attracted to it, because you enjoyed the hating. And then you feel guilty, and you love it, and it turns it into more of a wimp, because it will slop itself right into you, right? It will melt right into that love, and play, follow that game plan that you've been programmed to give. So I'm right then, aren't I? Mm -hmm. Okay. We, have we done an hour already? It's a whole hour, has it? Wow, a whole hour's gone. That's two half-hour shows. Well, we're going to do another show um, uh, next week. And uh, I've got to say this because we're you know, taping this for a live audience. And when it gets out to television land, it won't be alive. But we hope that it will stir some you know, reaction in everyone, because I know that not many people have heard dialogue like this before. Mostly you have these phony, stupid psychologists and psychiatrists, most of them are, I'm sorry to say, 
educated out of all the brains they ever born with. And uh, I just, just hope that this kind of simulation will, will uh, be the kind of uh, thing that you will come back to again and again and listen to me on radio and watch me on television whenever the programs are announced. And I just do want to thank the audience here for being so delightful. Thank you very much. Last week we did husband and wife thing. And I, you know, I can go on all night and all week and, and for a whole year on that subject. But just, well, there's so many people here had other questions that weren't necessarily relating to that, but probably it'll come back to that because that's how, how uh, where all the problems in life start between men and women. And your kids get it and they grow up to be men and women that produce children who are troubled, who grow up to be troubled parents and produce children and so on endlessly. So we're probably going to get back to it, but let's, let's see number unos. I want to know if, if she stays home and I start off, let's say start my own business, it'd be like a risk type of a, a gamble in faith. I mean, as far as... Uh, I'm not following you. Well... What's the question you're trying to okay, the question my trying, cage with? Okay. Um, I want to start my own business. All right. Okay. But, uh, you know, I haven't started it yet, and I want to know if, if she's staying home watching the kids, um, is it uh, like the t like a risk as far as a you mean, faith you, you type got, risk? You just to go to, out there and, like you said, the wind, the storm, and that type of thing. Yeah, well, you you uh, to develop my character. You you're worrying you're worrying about whether you can have enough money to exactly. carry the, carry over to your right. to your new business catches, right? Right. Right. Exactly. Well, I uh, I used to work for a living mm -hmm. before I became a television star <laughs> and an advisor, became a parasite like all the others. <laughs> <laughs> no, and so I used to be a diamond cutter, and I practiced professional hypnotism, but hypnotism was my love. There wasn't much of a market for it in those days, especially for a person, you know, who had, didn't have a degrees, and besides, in those days, I'm talking about, you know, how many years ago, 30 years ago, 35 years ago, they, it wasn't an accepted part of anything. The medical profession laughed at it. Anyway, I liked it. I knew there was some... I thought there was some future in it, and I was interested in So I had a diamond-cutting business, and I had my own thing. But gradually, what I did is what... I started this other business on the side, the hypnotism thing, a, and gradually uh, pulled away from my other business. I had a business already that I was in. See, I had my own business already. But how did I get into that? Is this by the same by the same techniques. I was working... And I started a business on the side, and when it got strong enough, it's like a, a monkey doesn't let go. You know, when he when he goes from tree to tree, he reaches from one branch to another and lets go of the branch when he feels he's got securely hold of another branch. I'm not sure that's how they do it, but that wouldn't be me if it was if I was a practical monkey. You know what I mean? <laughs> so what you need to do is to start a business in the evening, on weekends, and make it work. And don't jeopardize the health and the security and the stability of your family. You know, you just can't go jumping off into space. Okay? Make sense to you? That makes sense. Yeah. So that way you won't have to be afraid. Just do something and watch it grow. You won't have to have anxiety because things don't work when, they, when you have anxiety. When you have to sell a car. When you have to make a living. You, and you, your hands are sweating. And you have to sell something or achieve something. What happens, people sense that and they fight back and they'll, they, do, they make the opposite happen, don't they? Yeah, it's getting real rough out there. <laughs> yeah, see, now you, don't, you do much better when you're relaxed and you're happy and you can do most for your clients and for your business when you can do it because you enjoy it and not because you, you know, if they say no, you starve. Okay, the next question. Um, my question is about, I've been meditating for about a year and my, my whole life changed drastically. And about two months ago, I stopped meditating, and my life really changed. Back for, again. Yeah, for the worse. Well, well I, I once... Do you answer your own question, I hope? I've been trying to meditate, and it's like I can't... What have I told you? I don't know. Meditation is a commitment. I mean, there's all kinds of meditation. There's meditation that border on self-hypnosis. 
um, self-mesmeration, um, self-mesmerism, I should say, um, mesmerism, animal magnetism, and all those things we can discuss what they are in later, the, later discussions. But uh, <coughs> the meditation that I teach you is a commitment to a higher and truer self and to resist the stresses and temptations of the world and to drive those, the, the identity, the body that's formed out of those reactions out and let the new body, the Bible says the body of Christ, in from the inside to be remolded through your mind from within or another way of saying that is to be reborn, born again. See, the old self dies and the new self is implanted and it starts to grow. But you don't dare stop that process. You don't dare. It's deadly. Can I do this again? I can't tell you. <laughs> Possibly. Should never let... Next time, if it catches on, don't be stupid. Because you see, do you see what you've just said? It says that you could stop if you wanted to. In other words, what you're saying to me is that you weren't under a compulsion to meditate like the other people. If the, 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 the Hare Krishnas, the Maharishi people, the Rajneesh people, all the various yoga people, did you know that once they start to meditate, it is no longer meditation, an, a free will offering. It is a compulsion. It's like drugs. Once you're caught up into something for your salvation, once you're using a hypnotic something affixed to it as a false form of salvation for your ego or your pride, once you're fixed to that and committed to it, you can't stop, you can't give up your fix. You, you have to have your drug. You have to have your personality. See, to stimulate and make you, make you feel alive. It is once, once you're caught up in that sort of meditative fix, which is hypnosis, it's no longer a voluntary act of free will, um, surrender to your Creator every day. So what, it, what you're really saying is you could stop real easy, couldn't you? You decided you could stop. And that's, that is, I'm so glad you said it in a sense. In one, in one sense I'm not glad, because I hate to see you fall from, to flutter down again and start to suffer. But in another sense it made a, made a good point. You're not under any compulsion nor any obligation to continue in this. But you do so as a free will choice every day. Point made. Okay? Make sure you offer yourself then. Yes. Uh, Mr. Masters, uh, my question is, would you think it'd be wise for a person who meditates and is objective to hypnotic manipulations of others to remain in their presence for fear that maybe a subtle suggestion may creep in. Could you um, elucidate? <coughs> Pardon me? Could you elaborate? Give me the situation. Well, say the person isn't a hypnotist, but he's got those qualities that he's a, a, a manipulator. Well, then you find them everywhere. Right. Would you want to go in a monastery and avoid no, them? No, but I mean... Uh, Say you can see that he's uh, well, really you, subtle. With who are you his, talking about? Well, nobody, in, absolutely nobody in particular. Well, but somebody who could be that you know. It's not a clear question. Devil that could. Yeah, well, it's not a clear question. Well, uh, I don't know how to make it any clearer. I, I know, but it's still not a good question. I mean, I I mix freely with everybody in my daily um, business intercourse, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I meet all kinds of people. I don't shrink from, I'm not, I'm not stuck in the ladies' room or the men's room or stuck in my house. I'm, I go out in the world and I experience life. Well, in other words, some people I, some people I can have something in common with. Some people are too wimpy for me to have anything to do with. And some people are real manipulating um, sociopaths or psychopaths. But I can still b do business with them, but I just want to watch my P's and Q's, right? Mm -hmm. But then some people I would like to know to have more to do with, be my friends. Mm -hmm. There aren't many of those. Right, well, maybe in other words... 
But what is the question? It's just simple. Right. Well, in other words, like, um, should you stay there and listen? Stay where? Well, just any. Like, say you're in conversation with somebody, or or you're um, in the presence of somebody that, um, like your boss. Well, you we, okay? Well, okay. now we're getting somewhere. Yeah, that because uh, my boss is very intimidating, very well manipulative. You find and, me a boss that isn't. Right. Could would it be wise <laughs> to stay in his presence, or you know, and just watch him objectively? Or it's not a good question. Yeah. You're rambling there. It's not. Maybe yeah. I just don't have my words together. You don't, yeah. and you don't even have a. Qu you haven't. Got, you don't even know what the problem is yet. Yeah. What I'm. It would be wise to meditate, what, the way I'm teaching you, right. and learn to deal with every situation, with dignity and objective. This put an objective distance between you, and everybody, and you can feel. I, there are very strong, powerful entities. Individuals, characters, manipulators, you call them, sociopaths, psychopaths. And when you stand in the presence of one of these people, you can feel it in your, you can feel like you're being sucked into a great whirlpool. See? And you feel like you surrender to that individual. You can't help. You feel like when, when you're standing there, a Hitler had a tremendous power over people. He was a big black hole. And he sucked in everybody into it. And they thought that was love. And he, he approved them for their weakness. When It's like the, the irresistible vampire. You hate him, you fear him, but you feel irresistibly drawn, and you, even though you're terrified, you give your neck, right? That's the type of person you're talking about, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. you know, I've heard you say that um, some people have that capacity by being around you to know all the little buttons. But you can feel. Right. But for the most part, most people aren't that strong. Mm -hmm. You'll meet politicians and movie stars who have a great black aura a way of sucking the, the, the life, the guts out of everybody, like an octopus with a crab, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you don't meet many of those, thank goodness. But uh, there's enough people out there who you can feel them watching you through a dark hole, from the dark side of the force. And, they, and what they do is that the manipulator, this is an interesting te technical side of the question, and, 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 and you're making me say this, you know that. And I would never have said it otherwise. But you know how a radar signal sends out a blip and it bounces off the mountains or whatever obstacles and, and it gives a little shape or form on the video screen? It's called um, radar. Um, in, order, in order to for this creature to grope its way, because it's, a, it's basically a parasite, it has to send out signals. It's really an invisible signal. And you can feel them sending these signals out and scanning your whole body for weaknesses. And you can feel it, that someone's scanning you. Be on your guard. Be aware, because if you're not, you don't know how to deal with that moment, you can find yourself being drawn into their power, under their influence. And there's not a, may not a word... Not a word said. You find yourself, your, <laughs> your intellect, your mind is paralyzed. You find yourself going along and giving them things that, that you would never would have done under normal circumstances. And when they've gone, you can't understand why you, you gave everything away, why you did what you did. Women can give their bodies and that sort of thing to such people. And so, of course, you, you're actually, um, you, 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 you're, the way you deal with life sets you up for such meeting such a... a such a fate. So that's why you must, in everything you do in life, you must be strong, never give in into your dark side. See, because every time you give in to a dark side, uh, the dark side feeds on, uh, you're sacrificing a little bit of your soul. And your power, your moral power to resist such evil begins to atrophy. See, because if you give in to your own dark side, if you give in to any little whim, buying even a five cent candy bar, I don't think there is such a thing. I haven't bought one for such a long time. It's 35 cents right now. I feel like Rip Van Winkle, you know, I just woke up. Um, if you give, give in to a 35 cent candy bar, uh, you're weaker than you were before. Something says to you, you know, buy me, eat me. And, and you're giving up some part of yourself that is good and enlarging and feeding another part of yourself that isn't good. But the, but the more you do that, as you morally, as you begin to morally decay, 
when it comes to real life and meeting such an eventuality as we've been speaking about, you find yourself unable to morally resist. That's what's wrong with America today. Um, if Americans keep giving in to the immoral de demands and pressures around them, and they lose the fiber, the strength, the resoluteness to resist, the moral resoluteness to, to, to fight, then when it comes time to stand up against Russia or anything like that, we will not have the moral power to resist. We might even welcome them. Because we'll have, we have, will have become so much like the enemy that we'll have identified with them and surrendered to them as though it was love. See? Thank you very much. Does that make sense to you? Very much so. So watch these people scanning you, but prepare yourself for life. Do not give in to temptation, so you may be delivered from evil. For then his is the power and the glory. You see what I mean? Rather than the other. Okay, the next question. Um, just behind there, okay? What, what, about, what about just staggering fear? I mean, you know, I've, I've really developed a good way of projecting confidence. You know, everybody always tells me how confident I look. But you're not. What about that, that staggering fear that I feel inside that does close me off sometimes? Well, what about it? I don't understand what, uh, I, what name have you given it. I don't know what... Oh, well, okay, like for instance, I, I'm in the sales business, and sometimes I just won't call a client when I feel that way. I just won't call. I'll but but tell me what fear it is you feel. I don't. I can't even identify it. That's why I asked you. You've got to give me. You've got to do better than that. <laughs> uh huh. Well, it's a. It's it's a. I don't know. The fear of failure. I can't even describe it to you. It's fear like, of success. Well, Could it know. be a fear of success as more so than a fear of failure? Because you're I've such an. I've never been one. I what, what I'm, well, <laughs> yeah, but the point is, don't you wish that uh, people would? You could be discovered. For the weak, but you remember, you are you put out an an, uh, a, an illusion. Right. You put out a front, right. and people think you are solid, nice guy, good guy, and you live on that approval, don't you? You encourage that that thinking about you. Yeah, I encourage. You feel secure. You encourage it, mm -hmm. but it's also making you dependent on it. I suppose. Because in other words, as long as you, as long as that's going on. You can't really be the person you could be. As a matter of fact, it's encouraging you to be a weak person, a phony dependent upon, so that you, you, have to act, you have to act more like you're not in order to feel secure, which you're not. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? Are you, you're nodding your head kind of... Well, I, I, don't, I, I still don't see the way out of the jungle. Though. Well, but do you see, the, see the, what the problem is first? We have to see what the problem yes, is first. I see what the, yes, I see that. Could, in your own words, could you play it back for me? Yeah, well, what's happening is I become dependent on, on that adulation, so to speak. Right. And, uh, and that dependence makes me weaker still. Okay, and then you resent that. And I resent that. <laughs> ah, you do. That's the word right there. Don't you, re you even resent the people who... You wish, don't you wish somebody would see through you? And so, don't you wish deep down inside... Uh, uh, underneath in the fear of fears. Yeah, well, they're all they're, they're all groveling little measles in my mind when I see them do that. You have a <laughs> you have a contempt for everybody that sees you in that. In other words, you manipulate about. people to see you in a certain way, and, and you resent I, them for and it. I resent them for it exactly. Right. <laughs> so can, now, do you see the reason why you're afraid to call on your next client? Yes. Because deep down inside, you resent them. You know what you're like. You're like a woman. Yeah. I see that. You seduce people. To be, see, in other words, you have a prettiness about you, a beauty, and, and people love you for that, but it only encourages you to be a phony. Mm -hmm. See? It robs you, and their respect for you robs you of real salvation. It makes you dependent, and it, it, it encourages you to be an actor, more of an actor. It, it, you get drawn into that experience, don't mm -hmm. you see? And you resent them for it as though it was their fault. It's a vicious cycle. But don't you wish somebody would stand up until you say, hey, you're a phony? Yeah. Deep down inside, don't you wish that? Sure. Well, you're a phony. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> you just exposed it. Mm -hmm. Now, do you resent me for it? Now the problem is, do you resent... Oh, no. But, I mean, what's the way out of the jungle? I, well, I would say this. that being met, You see, deep down inside, what you're looking for is love. Mm -hmm. and, and someone to stop you. But you're too clever. <laughs> you see, you've got such a good disguise that you fool everybody. And you hate them for being so weak and being so fooled. That's what you say. You have contempt for the people you fool. Mm -hmm. And somehow you blame them for your dilemma. Resent them. Mm -hmm. 
Why don't you give up resenting those people? You don't have to tell them you're a phony. You don't have to do that. You just have to look at that condition from an objective point of view inside yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, just look at this and say, this is ridiculous. I'm re here, I'm res here I have fooled these people, and then I, I become addicted to, I puff up like a snake, and I have contempt for these people. This is ridiculous. Why don't you just resolve it just by watching yourself? Yeah, well, I didn't even realize I resented them, but just... Just now you did. Yeah, just now. Just the second. Was, yeah. And that keeps, the, that keeps the, uh, the vicious cycle going, because when you feel guilty, when you resent them, you feel guilty. What does a woman do? Did we talk about this last time? When a woman resents a man, she feels guilty. When she feels guilty, she puts on this beautiful makeup and she puts her best, she puts on her best everything, right? And then she starts to seduce. And the husband says, oh, you look wonderful, dear. And then he uses her. And he gives her all kinds of compliments and encourages her to be this way. But she doesn't want to be this way. She wishes her husband would not fall for that. <laughs> you see? But he does. And that encourages her to be a whore. Or... You see what? You're doing exactly the same thing. And then you resent your husband. Or you resent... Not you. You're, you're, not, you're a... <laughs> right. But she resents her husband for that. And it starts all over again. It's the resentment that separates you from whatever it is you could be and makes you loathingly dependent on this other system of things. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Resentment separates you from love and addicts you to false love. When you resent a person, listen very carefully, when you resent another human being, it produces millions of strange aberrations, strange fascinations and, and, and fixations and, and lusts and loves tormenting, each one more tormenting than the other. And the reason why it does is because when you resent anybody, it separates you from the ground of your original being. Let's take a good example of this. Let's forget your problem for a minute. We'll come right back to it. Children resent their parents for, what they are, what, for their failing to be parents. All right? Remember we spoke about that one time, time before. They resent their parents for not being what they should be for them. What is in a parent is in default of what should be there. If the good isn't there, then what is? Evil. There's only good, and there's a, it's the parent is not evil, and the parent isn't good. Good and evil are spiritual attributes. It is a, it is a quality of soul that is attached. It, it, it's, it's come, you're either coming out of good or you're coming out of evil, and something is in a person that you perceive and sense that loves you or doesn't have your best interest at heart. See? And this is what children sense in their, in their parents. Now, that quality, its purpose, once it gets inside your parents, who got it from their parents, who got it for their parents, all the way back to antiquity. But the, but, the, but the motive, the modus operandi of that type of spirit, it, it, it is to tempt you to fall, to seduce you. He does it with flattering and lies and, oh, what a wonderful child you are, what a wonderful person you are, how oh, dear, darling, falling with flattery. For, but the other method, so you come down for that love and become addicted to it. And then comes the hate out of that, because when you find yourself addicted, here comes the hate. But, but love or hate is a seductive power. So therefore, nearly always our seductions, nearly always our seduction has come, come from the injustice of our parents. There's something unholy sitting there looking at you in the place of what should be holy. And when children perceive that when they're very young, the cruelty of it, they resent their parents. And that's exactly what the thing inside parents who also have been seduced wants the, the child to feel. Because when the moment the child resents the parent, it has disobeyed a basic law of the universe, a universal law for human beings. It, as it applies to... Do you remember there are... There are there's a, an invisible circle that goes around the earth. It's called the equator where north becomes south, but there's no line there. 
So your conscience has invisible boundary. And it's that the purpose of the thing is to pull you across the boundary so that you go from West Germany into East Germany and come under a different system of things, don't you see? So that when you, as a child, you are unsuspectedly trapped into hating your mother and father when the commandment says don't. All right? And there's a purpose for it. It doesn't say, you know, honor your mother and father for no reason at all. There's a reason. Because your parents, your father especially, represents the bright side of the law. Even if he's a bad father, like a bad judge, he did, at least he represents the law. You must not hate your father. Now, I won't go into the ramifications of this, but the, the, the dark side of people is the same as the dark side as your parents. Because all those people are parents, aren't they? Most of them are. And victims of their parents, so their little children go home, come, c go to school, and take are cruel to the smaller children. See? So, there is in this world a spirit, so to speak, an attitude that teases you to be resentful. And when you're pulled away, when you react to that tempte, when you react, you obey it, you're separated by that disobedience from that divine law. You're pulled across to the West, from West Germany to East Germany, and you come under a whole different system of things. And you find yourself desolate, empty. And a strange thing happens. The creature, the imprinted self, the implanted self, seeks to fill the emptiness to complete itself not from its original ground of being which it, it's lost but from the very thing that traumatized it so that's why you always look that's why you have a love-hate relationship you hate and hate separates you from true love and it, and it puts into you a, a, an identity of the of the the corrupter it puts you in a little bit of that person gets inside you and that little bit cries out for the love of what recreated you in its image. See, and when it loves you, it fulfills you in a